looks like we are live. Good evening, everybody out there, Broncos country. Let me get the Facebook groups in here, as you know we have to do. Get the community in here, the Mile High Huddle, wonderful community, um, all in here on a great Friday evening. Mile high hello, everybody in Broncos country. Welcome into another episode of the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. I am your host, Lance Sanderson, and joining me as per usual is my good friend and colleague. He is Mile High Huddle's senior NFL draft analyst, the one and only Eric Trickle. And uh, we're through free agency. Obviously now, the, well, the, the main part of free agency, I should say. Uh, obviously, the big focus now is the draft. How are you doing, man? We pumping out a bunch of draft content. You keeping up? Uh, I am tired. Um <laughs> Can relate. Like no, I, I mean it's just been a lot of work. I mean I'm going back and I'm still watching some tape of some people, going back and watching some of others, um, based off of in, like certain things, bits of info that I hear. Mm -hmm. uh, long days, short nights, and I don't sleep well as it is, so it just leads to being more tired. I'm always like, I mean I'm always tired, always, uh, but even more so during this time of year. I mean it's a lot of you know, fourteen to 20 hour days with very little sleep. Yeah, I, I feel you on that. And this is your full-time job. So it definitely gives a grind to you. I mean, especially, I don't want to call it like prospect fatigue, but like watching football fatigue. Eventually you get to a point where it's like, God, do I really have to continue doing this? I'm tired of watching football for right now. Like I want to just be done with it. And for me, I mean, obviously I'm doing um, a bunch of five, five prospect articles. Go to milehighhuddle.com, guys. Go check out all of our work. There's a, a click down menu at the top left corner of the screen. You can go to the draft section, find all of our content. Eric's doing, I believe, daily um, daily scouting reports, one one versus one, essentially guys in the top 100. I'm doing five players, um, mostly focusing on the uh, the outside of the, of the top 100. But for me, like, I got to watch all those five players that's in the same day to be able to do all of that. So it takes like eight hours. It's it's a grind, and it, it does get to the point where it's like, man, it's eleven o'clock right now, and I really need to go to sleep because I got to wake up at three so I can go to my day job. Um, it, it's it's very very much so in like it's it's very exhausting, I guess. And I'm I'm right there with you, man. I need an, another good night's sleep tonight. I'm probably not gonna watch anyone today, but it's it's fun. This is always the the best time of the year for us here on Dove Valley Deep Divers because this is what we do. Obviously, senior NFL draft analyst here, me along for the ride, just trying to help out as much as I possibly can. But the NFL draft is what we do and what we love here uh, on this show. So thank you all for joining us here on a wonderful Friday evening. Uh, let's get to the chat really fast because we got our good buddy, Michael Ronquillo, the Ronk, jumping in early here saying, good evening, Lance and Eric on the Dove Valley Deep Divers. Go Broncos. Go Michael. Thank you again for joining us as you always do here every single show. He's on the Falcon shows with Scott. He's on the morning shows with Nick. He does um, every single night, always showing the love. This is one of the best uh, Mile High Huddle supporters. He is definitely one of those faces on the Mile High Huddle Mount Rushmore. Now, wow, that's a big that's five dollars worth of stars from Michael. Holy cow, man! Thank you for thank you for that. We definitely appreciate it. Let's say hello to everybody else. We got Todd Osendorf, William James Baker, William Catalano, David Youngkin in the house, uh, Daniel Berry. We've got um, String Guy, Zach Powers, a bunch of the usual faces. So thank you all for joining us. We're gonna run a Mile High Huddle mailbag uh, this evening. So Eric, first things first, anything you want to say to the chat before we get into this? Yeah, if you guys have any questions that you want answered, make sure you get them in. We'll try to get to them best we can. Um, and as many of them as we can, obviously some will take more, take a priority over others, just the way things work. Um, but, uh, yeah, just make sure you guys get your questions in a lot of conversations. Um, there'll probably be a lot, some repeat questions as well. Probably a lot of quarterback related questions. And, uh, as much as I'm so tired of talking about quarterbacks in the strap cycle already, um, it's it's inevitable you know it's just one of those things. It's, it's inevitable but i do want to point out one comment here todd you and i we don't see eye to eye on a lot but we see eye to eye here this is one of my yes. dudes in this year's draft yep uh, that actually goes into the first question i was going to ask you i've got so the the overarching theme of this show this evening is going to be talking about the broncos and their schematic designs what they like to do offensively what they like to do defensively and we're going to go through I want to kind of stay away from the the top level of the draft. Obviously, the Broncos are involved in the quarterback conversation. There's trade downs and stuff like that. I want to go really to where Eric shines. And a lot of the work that I've been doing this year, uh, typically about that uh, outside of the top 100, so the 75 to about 150, somewhere around in there, where the Broncos have a handful of picks. They've got a third round pick, a fourth round pick, a couple of fifth round picks, a couple of sixth round picks. Guys in that kind of area. And I want to talk specifically about the schemes for what these Broncos are actually going to be doing this season. And 
Isaac Garendo is one that ties directly into my first comment here. Um, obviously, with the Broncos and what they have in their running back room, it seems to be kind of set up very well right now. Um, Samaj P. Ryan, Javante Williams, obviously the two lead backs there. They've got Jaleel McLaughlin as the jitterbug back, um, a guy that just shows that explosive speeds. But also at the same time, Samaj P. Ryan still kind of a little bit unknown going into this season because he could be a salary cap casualty if the Broncos decide that they need to save a couple million dollars in that particular aspect. Obviously, Javante, the, the physical bell cow runner receiving upside, but P. Ryan brings a great receiving aspect and a great pass protector. So if you're looking at a player like an Isaac Garendo, for example, what kind of traits are you looking for for the Broncos that could help round out that running back room? So I think they're just looking for anything. And there's been a lot of talk about the Broncos wanting to upgrade the room. They want to find somebody who can be probably more consistent than Jaleel McLaughlin and still bring that explosive jitterbugginess to the, to the offense that they need. And as well as being more viable on third down because they have a pass blocking skill set. Um, as well, Samaji P. Ryan, obviously, as you said, he's a potential cap casualty. He's a guy that there's been a lot of talk that he may be one of those cuts in t training camp, depending on how things go with mm -hmm. other running backs that might not make it. Javante Williams, he's on the last year of his deal. Um, so they could be looking for a guy to kind of combine Samaji P. Ryan and Javante Williams to replace them both either this year or next year. Um, well, between this year and next year. Uh, so, so they have a lot of options for them going forward uh, with the running back room. But we have David Cromwell coming in where uh, with $20 donation. Thank you, David. We appreciate Thanks, that. Where Rap's comments, Ian Rappaport today, he had a uh, little, I think it was like about a minute, minute, 10 seconds, thing talking about the Raiders and the Broncos trading up for a quarterback. Anyways, where Rap's comments about Denver not feeling an urgency to trade up for a quarterback in round one because they love Stidham is essentially Denver saying we would like to move up but can't afford to and don't want to ruin Stidham's confidence. Uh, no, I think it's tough. I think it's a realization that unless a quarterback gets to eight, they're not going to be able to move up. <laughs> like that, that's the point is that of their ability to trade up without giving away too much. Because the thing is, is they've already gone multiple years without first round picks. They don't mm -hmm. want to go multiple years more without first round picks outside, after this year. So they know they can't give up too many future first round picks to get up early. Mm -hmm. They don't want to move Patrick Sertan to help them get up. Garrett Bowles doesn't bring enough value. Neither does Cortland Sutton to help them get up. So it's a situation of they know where they're going. And it's pretty much, I don't want to say cemented, but all the talk is that these the top four quarterbacks, they'll be gone by six. Six, yeah. six is the, six is the low point for the last one to go one two three and then either four five or six for the fourth one uh depending on trades being worked out so i don't think i think it's that i think it's them not wanting to tip their hand a little bit um i think it's also you know i think there is a little bit of not wanting to like ruin Stidham's confidence so i doubt they're too worried about that right uh so, so it's just a combination of things going out there um and the other part of the report was more so talking about the urgency from the Raiders to get up and move up for a quarterback because of where they're at as a team, which they are in a better position as a team with how the roster is built in their financial situation than the Broncos are and Antonio Pierce wanting to go get that quarterback because what's the easiest way to get fired as a new turn, new time head coach lose games. What's the best way to help you win games, having a quarterback. Yeah. I you and I were talking behind the scenes before we went live a little bit and talking specifically about this particular situation. The Broncos liking to move up. I probably can't afford to do so. Sims' confidence to me means pretty well nothing, quite honestly. Um, it, he's a bridge quarterback. Right now, it looks like there's a bridge to nowhere um, because the Broncos don't have that young quarterback to have Stidham be the bridge. But that's that's what his role is. He's here on the last year of his deal to be that bridge quarterback. Um, in terms of what I was talking about, you know, trading up, I think it's more likely that the Broncos trade down right now because first off, like Eric said, the four, the top four quarterbacks likely going to be gone before number six overall. Um, they, they, they could make a pick at number 12 overall, although I don't see that likely because as Eric said, they're lacking draft capital in general. Let's not talk about just the first round picks that they've given up over the last couple of seasons to not only get Russell Wilson, but also Sean Payton. Um, they're missing a second round pick this year. Um, I believe they're missing another, uh, another day three pick for next year. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I know 
they, they don't have a lot of capital right now. Trading back makes the most sense right now. If you can't get up to go and land one of those those big quarterbacks without giving up a major haul, like another first round pick or maybe a guy like a Pat Sertan, um, they're not going to do that. They want to go back and continue to work their way back, build capital as much as they can, and probably take a quarterback later in the draft, like a Bo Nix, maybe like a Michael Penix, if they can get him in the third round, something like that. Like that, that to me seems to be the direction that they're going in here. Eric, where, where did that comment go? The one about trading up to number four for McCarthy. Uh, that one, AJ, man, first things first. Thank you for joining in. Love the profile picture. Obviously a JJ McCarthy, Michigan Wolverines fan. Uh, do you think the Broncos will trade up to number four for JJ? No. I really don't. Again, they don't. They just don't have that kind of capital to be able to do so. I do think that they love him. I think that if they did have the opportunity to go and get him, they definitely would. But it's not going to be up to number four. And the thing with this, see, when we talk about all this, we have to look at things. Four is a spot they'd have to trade up. The Chargers aren't going to help Denver out. They're not going to trade them unless, like, it is an outstanding deal. Mm -hmm. They're not going to trade with Denver to let them get a quarterback. The Giants, they want that quarterback. They're basically quarterback or wide receiver at this point from everything that it sounds like yep. so the cardinals to get to four from what i've gathered it sounds like the cardinals are looking for multiple first round picks another day two pick and a couple day three picks they're looking for a ransom because all the expectation is that quarterbacks go one two three and that drives up the price for that fourth spot because it's also a premium position at quarterback yep. i just don't see how denver can do it e even yeah. if they I, they want to but even if they really wanted to get up that high uh, they, they, I just don't think that they can without including players and it's players that they don't want to include. Yeah. It, well, obviously they, they, they went out and they restructured Cortland Sutton's deal, gave him a little bit of injury guarantees as well. Um, so they want him around. Um, they've, um, they've already restructured Tim Patrick's contract. Doesn't sound like they're going to move on from Garrett Bowles. I'm not sure if they're going to do anything with that, um, with that contract, but that's another, that's another move that they could do restructure, extend, add some void years in there. And, um, and maybe keep Garrett Bowles around. Like that's that's a cornerstone piece of your offensive line right now. Garrett Bowles is a top twelve, maybe top ten left tackle in the NFL. So moving on from a guy like that, especially when you were talking about bringing in a rookie quarterback, bringing in a bridge guy like a Jarrett Stidham, why would you make a hole on the offensive line that you then have to go back out and refill with your limited draft capital as it is? So um, it. Moving players is is a way to get around that, but I don't think the Broncos have guys that they can actually do that with right now, at least not in this in their current situation. Uh, David jumping back in here with another ten dollars super chat, saying, "Would it be a catastrophe if Denver didn't end up with Bo Nix or Michael Penix Jr.?" I don't think so. No need to force it at quarterback in year one of a rebuild. Pratt would suffice in round three or four, in my honest opinion. And David, I'm actually kind of there with you. I don't think that quarterback is, while it is a huge need, and obviously um, the Broncos need to go and address that quarterback position, I don't think that it would be the end of the world if they didn't get Bo Nix or Michael Penix Jr. right now. As much as I like Michael Penix Jr., I don't think he's, the more that I study him, um, the more that I really firmly believe he's not a fit for Sean Payton to begin with. Pratt would be a, fine young guy to kind of develop, but he's not going to turn into anything specifically. You've got to build this roster right now, just in any way, shape or form, build this roster, make a comfortable situation for a quarterback to land in. And then you can actually maybe get this rebuild off on the right foot. Eric, what do you think, man? Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's a, would be a catastrophe. If they don't end up with Bo Nix or Michael Penix. Um, both of them are where Broncos local media and people in the chat seem to be a lot higher than everything I've heard from NFL teams. Mm -hmm. um, both of them are widely viewed as day two guys. And we're talking about them at 12. Like, uh, But anyways, uh, Michael Pratt, he's one of those guys that maybe he could be like, you know, he could be that bridge quarterback type guy if he can mm -hmm. develop a little bit. But at the very least, he's looking, he's at the, ver at the very, what's the right word, way to put it? Most likely, there we go. That's the best way to put it. He's probably one of those at best mid, you know, mid level backups at best. That, that's where I think he ends up. He has a bit more potential than that. But how often do we see guys really hit their ceiling, especially at the quarterback position? Mm -hmm. um, and especially guys that are drafted, you know, day round three, round four, as mm -hmm. we're talking about with Pratt. Right. I don't have high expectations for him in the NFL. I'd still be fine with it. Help the Broncos lose games, help them get a better draft pick next year. 
Yeah, and Scott coming in here in our, our private chat saying, yeah, Bessie's Brett yeah. Rippin. I, 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 I think that that's probably accurate. Um, I, I'll go maybe a step further and say a guy – this is not a side-by-side -side comparison of the two, just more of a situational comparison here. Uh, Aiden O'Connell, a, a young guy that you bring in, you don't really have an option, and you need just to throw him out there and start, see what he can do. Plays well, not the greatest, not a guy that you're really going to hit your wagon to as the, the future of the franchise, but somebody that you can come in and – spot start for you if nothing else high quality backup player like like scott said like eric said brett rippon aiden o'connell similar kind of situations there uh we have phil mclaughlin jumping in here over on facebook as he is always want to do great to have you in the show again phil we definitely appreciate your support man saying good evening lance and eric i'm tired of the quarterback talk me too man i'm, I'm so tired of talking quarterbacks for this broncos team but it's, it's never going to end until we get that guy uh, he's saying, let's draft uh, let's draft one somewhere and then break him down. I want offensive line and uh, defensive line edge somewhere. So trading back seems logical to me. Hashtag Buckham. Hashtag MHH for life. Hashtag Broncos for life. So thank you, Phil, for joining in. We definitely appreciate that. I'm going to move this conversation back a little bit. Let's go backwards a hair. Isaac Garendo. Eric, I know that you, you just said that he's one of your dudes. I loved his tape out of Louisville. He is so much fun to watch. Break him down for everybody just to kind of tell everyone what he's going to bring to this room. Well, I mean, he's one of those guys that you're going to be looking at to try to upgrade over Jaleel McLaughlin. He's just like, I don't want to say he's a home run hitter consistently, but he's a big play waiting to happen. And eventually he'll break one um, through. You want to give him touches a little bit. Um, I can't remember his fumble rate off the top of my head, um, if it was good or not. Um, but I mean, he is, he can be a weapon on offense. I think that you can even move him out and line him up in the slot. Something that Sean Payton has shown that he likes to do, um, throughout his, uh, throughout his career. I mean, with multiple running backs that he's had, even this last year in Denver, he did it quite a bit. Um, so I think if, if you really want to upgrade over Jaleel McLaughlin, he wouldn't be a bad option there. Probably mid late day three uh just with the, the way that this running back class is uh kind of shaping up to be yeah i i like him a little bit better than that i think you can probably get him in in the fourth round um for for the broncos uh explosive this guy has long speed it takes a minute for him to get going he's not like the, like the most explosive or bursty type type of player but that speed when he gets the, gets a full head of steam he's gone like he has incredible explosive playmaking potential man um I, I like his his cutting ability but that again that first step burst coming out of those cuts is um a little bit a little bit wonky and i wish that he had that first step get to 60 miles an hour and go uh, more than he than he currently has. I'm trying to find his fumble rate right now, and I'm I'm struggling to do that. So I'll just move our, our conversation forward a little bit here. Um, Tyler Welch jumping in here. Blake Corum running back out of Michigan. If we want to talk Michigan prospects, they had their pro day today. There was 22 players, I think, in attendance there. Um, a, a handful of players really stood out, from what I understand. Blake Corum is he a fit? Yeah, I mean he, he he's the type of player that you could throw him in basically any running scheme and have him be effective. Um, I don't think, I know a lot of people have him up to be a bell cow type, that number one guy. I don't think he's that. Um, I think his best bet is that number two, uh, that number two guy. Um, and just with the way he is, and he's got a lot of mileage on the tires already. Yeah. Um, something to cut that back a little bit. And there is a strong correlation between, you know, usage in the, in college, the usage in the NFL and the ideal touch rate is like, I believe is 400 to 800 touches. And Blake Corum is like just hit right there about 800, if I remember correctly. Um, so he's just right there on that borderline of it. And I, so I think that you got to be really careful with the way you use him and don't want to overuse him, especially with his size. Right. Is, is he going to be one of the, the top running backs drafted? Is he even going to be there around the um, the 75 pick that the Broncos have right now? Uh, is, that a, is that an option or is he going to be a, a top 64 player, do you think? It is hard to get a read on when these running backs start going, right? Um, because it isn't a great class, and there is no top level talent. They're all viewed as maybe round two guys, a lot of round three guys. So once we get that running back run started, I wouldn't be surprised if we see, you know, five, six, seven guys go relatively quickly in a row, and he'll definitely be part of that. Where that run starts. I could see it start right around, you know, 50 to 55, but I could also see it start somewhere around, you know, 70, 75. 
Okay. That makes sense. And with Corum, like you said, the size thing, he's built well, like he's got a good upper body. He's muscular. He, I mean, he's built like a brick, you know, what house, but um, the mileage, I think you're right with that. The mileage is a big thing. He also had the knee injury, um, not this past season, the season before, which was a big reason why everyone said that he should have entered the 2023 NFL draft uh, comes back, wins a national championship with the Michigan Wolverines this last season and adds more mileage on those tires. Last running back question I have for you. Cause a guy that I'm very intrigued by Marshawn Lloyd, um, the, the running back from USC, big physical power back, good receiving ability. Is he a guy that you would look to add to this room or is he a little bit redundant with Javante Williams? Uh, I wouldn't look his way because of his fumble rate. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I didn't know that. So that's, that's a good, that's a good point it, it, to bring it's up. pretty bad. And then you add in the medical history and everything like that. It's just very concerning. He is impressive on tape. Powerful guy can catch. Well, uh, didn't show it. Didn't, um, didn't show, you know, like this great receiving ability consistently at USC, but throughout the draft process at the pro day, he showed it a lot more. He showed improvements that were needed. Um, so, I mean, he'd be fine. Um, he's definitely a guy that you could look at. He can be one of those guys when we, when I, we first started talking about this, I mentioned that you can look at a guy, you know, moving on from Samaji P Ryan, you know, before the camp and then letting Javante Williams walk out next year. He could be that guy that can kind of replace them both a little bit. You'd still obviously need that number two guy to come and help out some. Um, but yeah, that's definitely what you can look at him for. But that fumble rate and those injuries, um, okay. there's been some uh, bad rumblings about the injuries and then that fumble rate is really bad. Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't know the fumble rate. I just I've I've only seen a, a handful of games of his and he's he's fun. He's really fun to watch. Um I think that I did see two fumbles on those tapes. Regardless, anyways. Um Guys, if you guys have any questions, please make sure you get them in here. Like, help us out here. This is a mailbag. We want your guys' input. We want you guys to really kind of help us guide the show. Obviously, super super chat and stars donations are gonna are gonna take the priority here. Any questions, so long as it's kind of pertaining to what we're really talking about in the moment, we'll try to grab as many of those as you can. So, if you have any player players that you want uh, Eric to talk about or even myself to talk about, get those in. We'll answer as many of those as we possibly can. I don't want to run the show on my own end. I want to get you guys involved as much as humanly possible. So please help, <coughs> excuse me, help us out a little bit. Uh, while we get some new comments coming in here, let's go. Oh, wait, we got Phil jumping in here uh, saying, guys, I'm just curious in the 2022 draft, do you remember where you had Brock Purdy ranked? Um, man, for me, I, I don't remember, honestly. I don't think that I watched enough Purdy tape. I know that you did. I know you had a very strong opinion on Brock Purdy. I'll let you share it, though. No, you are mixing up when Brock, like his first year starting at Iowa State, I was a big fan of Brock Purdy. I liked what he did. And then the more I watched, the less I came down. He ended okay. up, I actually pulled up my rankings here. He ended up as my 15th overall quarterback. And let me do a control F real quick to see. Um, he was a priority free agent grade for me. Uh, just so many questions about him. Um, and he just, Brock Purdy is one of those guys that you look at as an exception um, to the rule so much for him to not succeed with him as a player, but he just goes to the perfect situation for him. Yeah. I was about right, to say that with the right weapons in town, everything was just so perfect for him. And that is extremely hard to do and great job by the San Francisco 49ers in evaluating him, finding him. He fit exactly what they wanted, um, what they were looking for. They weren't looking at him to be, you know, they were looking at him to be the backup. Um, and they just ended up hitting it out of the park with that. I mean, it was just a great pick. It's like the New England Patriots finding Tom Brady in the sixth round. Like, just mm -hmm. and it, 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 some, I don't want to say luck involved, but definitely some, uh, you know, just being the right, the right, uh, right team, right situation, stuff like that. That is, you, you just can't project in pre draft analysis. Well, and you're also talking about one of the best play callers in terms of understanding what his players are and how to accentuate their skill sets in, in the best possible way. I mean, Kyle Shanahan is one of the top offensive minds in football right now. I, I, maybe Andy Reid is probably the only one that I can think of that is a better offensive mind in terms of innovation and understanding and putting his players in the right positions to succeed. Maybe Sean McVay would be there as well. But again, with Purdy, you go to that situation where you have a good offensive line. They're going to... Uh, 
upgrade that this year, but you have weapons. They bring in Christian McCaffrey. They've got Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, uh, George Kittle as well. A uh, great play caller, great play designer. It's just the perfect situation for a guy that just go in there and just manage the game. Don't turn the football over to get it to the, to the right guy, process the information quickly, and let's, let's go to work here. Uh, we got a couple of things here. I was actually going to transition over to the wide receiver room, but we have a fan favorite, who if he definitely ends up in Denver, would be a fan favorite. Todd Osendorf jumping in. Eric and Lance, what do you think about Luke McCaffrey, wide receiver out of Rice, son of former Denver Broncos wide receiver Ed McCaffrey? Uh, he came in for the, the for a visit, for a pre-draft visit, so the Broncos have interest. I saw this earlier. I'm like, you know what? I can see this. This is a, this is a Sean Payton type of archetype, man. What do you think of Luke McCaffrey first? Yeah, I mean um... – First things first, the way Team Jews visit, it's always hard to, you know, predict. Some teams, one year, they'll use them as somebody they have serious interest in. Another year, it's guys that they just have questions about and that they want to get answered. Doesn't mean that there's a lot of interest there. And other guys, it's they use those visits to th try to throw off other teams with who they're actually interested in. It's a wide array of it. Um, I would assume that the Broncos do have interest there, but can't say for sure because it, it makes sense for them. He, as you said, he is one of those types of receivers, especially if he can develop more, which there is a lot of development that needs to happen there as he's still learning to be a wide receiver. Um, but he has, you know, outside sources, outside reliability, outside coaching that he can kind of look to to help him with that um, mm -hmm. and his father. But he, he fits with what Sean Payton wants to do on offense. He could fit in with the wide receiver room. They didn't do a whole lot of work on it, um, as much work as we expected. The, I mean, that big restructure on Tim Patrick, well, pay cut out of Tim Patrick, um, keeping Colton Sutton, trading away Jerry Judy. A lot of questions about Marvin Mims and his ability to develop. Um, Luke McCaffrey is a good fit for them with what they need and what they use and can potentially, if he can develop, can be looked at as one of those guys to replace, you know, that Tim Patrick or Cortland Sutton um, in this offense a little bit. Right. Um, there's another player that Todd is bringing up into the conversation as well. And this is a guy that I really, really like. Um, where did it go? Damn it. Uh, tell with it. Uh, Ricky Pearsall, the wide receiver out of Florida, man. Slot, inside, outside versatility. Um, physical as all hell. Uh, great catch radius. This kid's fun. Is he a guy that kind of fits that Sean Payton archetype? Is that a guy that you're interested in for the Broncos if he's there on day three? Because I don't think he's going to make it past the top 40. Um. I think I think he'll go right around you know fifty to sixty somewhere in that okay. late second round range, but yeah, I mean, the Ricky Pearsall. I mean, I, I'm one. I'm a huge fan of him. Uh, one of my draft crushes this year. Another one. Uh, uh, so it's. Uh, I, I mean, I haven't gotten to talk about receivers a lot, but Ricky Pearsall. I mean, as I was saying, is he's one of the guys that I like a lot. I don't see as much inside outside versatility. I think he's a slot only guy. But okay. I think he has an easy pathway to be a great slot right away. And just there's some good nuance in his route running. He knows how to find the soft spot in zone. Everything that you look for on the mental side of it that you ask of your slot receiver, he has it down. Like he just has that understanding, um, that innate way to see the game that you kind of need from receivers, from slot receivers. They got to see it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And he's got, he has that. Um, his couch, catch radius can be great. He can just, such a great fit with what they want to do offensively. Uh, my quite my only question is with a guy who is a slot only uh, prospect. I think Marvin Mims is a slot only prospect. Yeah, and I think that it, getting them both on the field at the same time could be a little clunky. It's doable, um, but it's limiting what you can do with Marvin Mims. I think in, in that at that point, right? Uh, gives the call to action, and Zach Powers comes in with a handful of rapid fire ones, but. Since we're talking Ricky Pearsall, I'm not going to grab the Lad McConkey one. Uh, he's saying Ricky Pearsall or Lad McConkey. Lad McConkey's probably going to be a first round player. It, talk about elite separator from the slot. Like this kid's ridiculous. There is a guy, though, that could potentially be available for the Broncos. And if you want to talk about, again, slot receivers, getting slot receivers on the field, Ricky Pearsall or Roman Wilson, Eric, what do you think? Ricky Pearsall. Okay. Uh, is there a, a schematic uh, difference there, or is it just a talent thing with you? 
No, it's just I just prefer Ricky Pierce all over. <laughs> <more. laughs> Roman Wilson. But <laughs> what what about Roman Wilson? Because I know that he went down to the Senior Bowl um, and really showed that that ability out of the slot, the reliability with his hands, um, really good route running, a really good processor as well, from what I understand. Just break down Roman Wilson for people that don't know who he is. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of what you just said. He, he can work in the slot. He, I think he's got a little bit more outside versatility mm -hmm. um, than Ricky Pierce Hall does. He's reliable. His route running is good. I question how much more there is for him to grow as a player, as a receiver, okay. um, which is I think that I, which is part of why I prefer Ricky Pierce Hall a little bit. Um, and uh, so he just just that that's a big thing for me. Uh, also, is how much more room, how much better that can they be? I think Roman Wilson could be a really good wide receiver in the nfl mm -hmm. um I, I don't think that scheme really matters a whole lot to him same thing with ricky pearsall um it's just i think ricky pearsall could end up being a outstanding slot receiver and roman wilson could end up being a great wide receiver if right that makes sense right he's he's more z kind of an off the ball not really a, like true slot he can play inside and outside I'm going to throw out a comparison here. And the more that I think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense. He reminds me a lot of Emmanuel Sanders, similar size, similar build, similar play style. Like there's that's, if you're looking for kind of a comparison for what Roman Wilson is, is that accurate? Or am I completely off base there? Um, I think Roman Wilson. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I think Roman Wilson... Roman... Good Lord. Go, you go first. You go first. I think Roman, I think Roman Wilson is not as, um, I mean, Emmanuel Sanders, what hit the name to his game was his ability to be a deep threat. Mm -hmm. I mean, just so consistently, the way he would use speed variants to set up corners and catch them lagging in their back pedal or in their transitions and then explode out of that. Um, I think Roman Wilson is more of a um, short field intermediate guy um, than deep ball, but there are definitely a lot of similarities there between the two. Okay. Um, so last question specifically to the wide receivers. I, I got a whole spiel here, but this is a great conversation. Um, obviously they didn't, uh, they didn't go under like much of that transformation, the big restructure for Tim Patrick. Um, we we kind of talked about Marvin Mims. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole right now. I want to talk about like the schematically with what the Broncos are doing right now um, with, uh, with in-breaking routes and stuff like that. What traits are we looking for, for the Broncos? Uh, and like, what's a later round prospect that, has a little bit of starting upside that can line up on the outside uh, as the Tim Patrick replacement. Should he get injured again, or maybe they just want to go in a different direction there? Um, as for what you're kind of looking for, the Broncos, you really want to look for foot quickness and agility and how sharp they can make those cuts. Cause one of the big things that you don't want when you are, you know, heavy on those inside routes that work in the middle of the field, um, with your uh, breaks and everything, you don't want to round your breaks because that just makes it so much easier for defensive backs to jump your routes. So you want that sharpness there. And that's one big one big thing that I'm looking for this year um, and was looking for last year compared to some other one other years. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably one, that's probably the biggest. How sharp are they? Can they, you know, just plant that foot, drive off of it and explode out of it, create that instant separation out of the break and make themselves a target? Or are they kind of like gather stepping into it planting that foot, kind of rounding out that corner a little bit and basically keeping the corner on their hip instead of breaking away from them. Um, a later round guy who can kind of fill that. I mean, th there's a lot in this year that can kind of fill that kind of just, role for them. This, receiver this, class is such is a, this, is a, this is a ridiculous receiver class. So much talent at the top. You have three guys who could be wide receiver ones. Um, and I think it was Jordan Reed of ESPN. He made a comment today that he's got – 12 receivers with day two grade day two grades um which i think i'm pretty sure i'm right around there as well mm -hmm. the ridiculous receiver class there are guys that are going to be gotten in the third and fourth round that other years could, would probably be gone in the second round um so there is mm -hmm. a lot of ways that the broncos can look at to continue rounding out this room yeah i i like javon uh javon baker the kid out of ucf former alabama kid uh big body i think he's 6'3 215 something like that really good route runner a, a big catch radius like he's a he's a very physical player to watch and another guy that probably doesn't fit as well as i thought he did seeing his athletic testing numbers uh for a late round guy if you're looking for a possession receiver big body x receiver um marcus rosemi jackson I fell in love with his tape, man. He is a physical player. He's got a good catch radius. Some of the probably the most reliable hands in this class right now. But he runs a four eight four. He's slow. This dude is slow, slow, slow. 
And he's not necessarily the most, obviously being that slow, you're not explosive. So he doesn't have the, the good first step first rounds his routes a little bit. So I'm not really sure that he's going to fit as much as I thought he is. And Eric, you need to go back into my scouting report, drop that round grade from a fifth to a seventh, because that speed is a huge detriment to his game. Obviously, you know what he is when you watch him on tape, but that is a, that's a, a big detriment. 484 is like a Death. It's like the four six number for cornerbacks. If you're below four six for a wide receiver, that's the bad, bad, bad look for you. Um, is that the confirmed time? I think so, because that was so. That was on NFLDraftScout.com, and they're the ones that pulled the the same numbers for Kamari Lasseter out of that um, out of the the Georgia Pro Day, and that's where Lasseter ran the four six five. Because everyone said that, like the the original reporting on it was uh, like Field Yates was saying a four five one or something like that. Multiple Field Yates was, one, four, of the, was one. Only, one of the only people that was saying that. Okay, I, I thought that there was multiple other ones that had said that as well. But regardless, after I, I think it was Marcus Mosher is the one that um, that originally tweeted that with NFLDraftScout.com. Uh, but they had Kamari Lasseter, the cornerback out of Georgia, running a four six five, which is. It, it shows on tape. The, kid, the guy just doesn't have long speed. Marcus Roseme Jackson is the exact same way. He doesn't have long speed. He's not a build up speed guy. It's, it takes forever to get out of his breaks. Um, that that four eight four number. I was like, I hope it's below four six. If it's that, if it really is that bad, four eight four, you're you're talking potentially undraftable player because is you you need better speed than that. All the the other intangibles in terms of physicality uh, the blocking uh his hands uh the ability to play with with uh with concentration at the catch point and just box out defenders all of that's great you you still have to be an athlete at the nfl level yeah um i'm trying to find and see if that was an official number there um because i saw some contention over that okay saying that he actually ran in the low four fives high four sixes okay. um still not ideal um, but it is definitely better, and I have not been able to confirm, you know, a, an official number for him yet. Okay. Um, so, well, if, if we do get to the official, then I'll then I'll correct that. Four eight four is terrible. If it's the four sixes, that would probably check a little bit better with what I saw on tape. But you can tell he's like I said, he's not a long speed guy. Anyways, uh, there was a question here in the chat. It was a little bit different, and it, it's going to be fun. And Eric, I. I know that we, well, first things first, we got Austin uh, D Deegan Hart, Deegan Hart. I, I apologize if I'm butchering your name, Austin jumping in here on Facebook saying, excuse me, if we do decide to trade down from 12 to say somewhere between picks 28 to 35, assuming we're all in on drafting a quarterback, what kind of realistic draft compensation could we get? Just thinking about when, uh, what went down when they went from 10 to 20 for 52 and a 2020 third rounder from the Steelers. Uh, that was the 2019 NFL draft where they had the 10th pick moved down to number 20 and took Noah Fant and then used which is, uh, that. Which is really, uh, it's really relevant. It is. Bringing up that trade yeah. because leading up to the draft for the month prior, who was the pick at 10? Drew Locke. It was I was Drew comfortable Locke. with the Broncos Denver's, taking him at Denver's 10. taking Drew Locke. Denver's taking Drew Locke. Denver traded down. Denver's taking Drew Locke. Denver's taking Drew Locke. It's this year. It screams that we're getting the same situation with Bo Nix. It really does. It really does. So, is that something similar? The Broncos could get uh, trade down. Get I think they got two third round picks because they got a first. For, they, I know they got the twentieth, and then I know they got uh, the the future third, which then they packaged. I think both of those together to go back up and then take. So they took Dalton Reisner first, and then they traded back up with the Bengals to get. Um, to to get Drew Locke. What was the, the compensation on that? Um, they traded 10 to Pittsburgh in exchange for a first and second round selection, 20 and 52, as well as a third round selection in 2020. That was the trade. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, but what is is that something that Denver could be looking at for this year? If they wanted to move down, uh, let's let's call it um like the Rams, for example, into the into the, the mid twenties, are they getting uh, two second round picks, uh, like one this year, one next year, or is it still kind of the same general over the like value there? Because I, I believe that the the Steelers, when they traded up, they went and, they went and picked Devin Bush. Yeah. Um. So it obviously it, one thing with using past trades is the position they're trading for does factor into it. Um. Higher value positions seems typically ask for a little bit more to move up. Um, it's not something like, oh, you're moving up for a wide receiver now, unless it's like a top quarterback. Oh, you're moving up for an offensive tackle instead of a linebacker. We're going to ask for a future second as well on top of everything else. It's not like that. It's like, all right, well, 20 to 10, let's say 
let's say 20 to 12. All right, we're going to get the, you know, we're going to get 20. We're going to get that second round pick. We're going to get a future third. And then we're probably going to ask for like a sixth. Like that'll probably right. be just that little bit if you're moving. Like that's probably that's just a small difference there. Um, and maybe giving up a seventh back, like just things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's where you're kind of looking at. Denver wants a second round pick this year. They want to add a little bit of future capital, um, a future pick. So I do think that's kind of what you're kind of what you're looking at there obviously the maybe they decide like all right well you can keep that second you can keep the third just give us the first year first this year and then a first next year like that's always right. an option predicting trades is something that i really hate to do um or have grown to hate to do i should say because i used to love doing it but then i realized the futility of it all because there is no set way to do it the public pick the value boards that public has is nowhere near close to what NFL teams have. They mm -hmm. use a variation that is kind of centered around all three of them. Um, and then they factor in so many other things for it as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, Denver's looking, Denver's looking for more picks between this year and next year. Right. Well, and, and another big variable in the, in projecting trades is obviously the, um, the strength of the class in general. I mean, you've got the the quarterbacks at the top of this class, but the offensive tackle class is huge. It's a very valuable position. Um, teams could be wanting to come up and, and get one of those offensive tackles. Well, this offensive tackle being a premium position, especially on the left side, if you're a pass protector, like there's, you, you can ask for a little bit more. Like, like I kind of said, you know, the, the Steelers, when they traded up for the Bron with the Broncos to get number 10 overall, they went and, and took a linebacker and he wasn't necessarily a very good linebacker. In my opinion, I was not a Devin Bush fan. Um, so that, that sliding scale valuation of what the, what the, the league thinks of this class in general definitely kind of skews things. And like you said, we don't know exactly what the what the the sliding scale or the even the the pick valuation or how players can get involved in this. That we don't know what that all looks like. We have kind of an idea, but it's more for the talking point of it than the actual accuracy of it. Doug, my comment was in no way a comparison between the two actual quarterbacks. <laughs> no, yes, no, no, they no. are very they are very different quarterbacks. It wasn't a comparison between the two. Uh, uh, Phil jumping in here saying, where were you guys ranking uh, per Barton and Roach when they came out and who will be the biggest help next year? So talking uh, Matthew Pert, offensive tackle coming out of UConn. I believe I had him as a third round pick. Um, Cody Barton and uh, Malcolm Roach. Eric, I didn't watch neither one of Cody Barton or Malcolm Roach. So I'm going to kind of rely on you here. I know that Pert with the athleticism was a guy that I kind of liked, but uh, how does he help? How, how do these guys help this Denver Broncos team in 2024? Outside of Malcolm Roach, poorly. If, if we're seeing Matthew, if we're seeing Matt Pert hit the field, it's because of injury. Mm -hmm. Um, like he's not good. He struggled to make an impact on a bad offensive line there for a while in New York. Was a rotational piece for them. Never developed. Um, maybe we can get something out of him. Expectations for him are extremely low. Um, uh, Cody Barton. It's a one-year prove-it deal again. Uh, he's not good. Uh, he does all right against the run, but in coverage, I mean, his back is constantly to the quarterback and he loses his guy still somehow manages to lose his guys in coverage consistently. Malcolm Roach is a pretty solid run defender. Um, he could end up a starter on this unit just to boost that mm -hmm. doesn't offer up a whole lot as a pass rusher. Um, but I, I think it's probably best to keep, find another, you know, another guy and just use him as that first guy as part of the rotation. Yeah. Um, uh, so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm 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 kind of there with you. A uh, little bit more nose to three technique interior defensive lineman. We we broke him down. I believe it was last week on the show. It might have been the week before with the with the whole free agency um, period. Um, so if you guys have any more questions about that, go check out the check out the other shows. It was the free agency review. I believe that was last week that we did that, um, where Eric actually really broke down Malcolm Roach and Cody Barton. It was a it was a fun show. So I do encourage you guys to go and check that out. Uh, Mike Edel jumping in here. This is a new name for me. I do not recall seeing this name. So thank you, Mike, for joining us. Hopefully you enjoy the show. Saying, uh, good evening, Eric and Lance. Do you think that they will draft two quarterbacks, one in the later rounds as a project? Never seems to hurt to have an extra quarterback for trades later on. Go Broncos. Great show. Thank you, Michael. We definitely appreciate that. Um, oh, man, I... I my original, my original thought process is sure. I mean, it, it, anything's possible. This is the NFL draft, but I don't think that that's a, a direction that the, the Broncos are going to be going in, in my personal opinion. 
And the reason I say that is because, yes, you do need to find that quarterback, but you still have other holes on this roster. Eric and I have poked holes in multiple different positions on this roster, and we were trying to do that a little bit earlier. You you can – I mean, I don't know if they would draft one. They might go and get a, uh, an undrafted guy just to bring in and kind of help round out the room, but drafting two guys, Eric, I don't, I don't think that's a plausible – I mean, I guess plausible uh, – not not a likely scenario, I guess, is the way I'll put that for you. Uh, real quick, just talking about great quarterbacks don't have cannon arms. Um, somebody mentioned John Elway and then always a few exceptions. The exceptions are more so that they don't have cannon arms and they actually do. Most quarterbacks have great arms. Most great mm-hmm. quarterbacks have had great arms. Right. Uh, but anyways, uh, as for your question about getting two quarterbacks, I think between now and training camp, the Broncos add at least three quarterbacks – one, a veteran who has experience, and then two rookies. Whether they're both in the draft or one's drafted and one's a college free agent, not sure. I think that they're going to be adding three quarterbacks between now and then, two of them rookies. And I don't think that quarterback is coming at 12. No. I, I Either move I, up and somehow land a quarterback who fell, or they move down. There's not much of a risk with losing Bo Nix, guys. <laughs> the other teams that are linked to quarterbacks, they're not super high on Bo Nix. Other like, quarterbacks, they're high on. Right. The the thing that I think is the um the the most the the loudest opinion right now is obviously the first four quarterbacks go in the top six, and then there's probably not another quarterback taken in the first round unless the Broncos take Bo Nix. Like that that's literally the buzz right now. It, it, go around and look at. I think it's like Mel Kuyper, Jordan Reed, um, any of the big draft, uh, the draft Knicks, um, even NFL insiders like, yeah, after the top four, there's probably not another quarterback that goes in the first round unless the Broncos take Bo Knicks. Like that's everything that I've seen in the last, what, four or five days, Eric, right? Or am I gaslighting myself in this whole situation? No, Bo Knicks, he's had the sudden rise to being, you know, the pick for the Broncos at 12. And as I said last week, it's all – with all the conversations that I've had about it, it all seems to be that, hey, the Broncos need a quarterback. They do have interest in Bo Nix. We're making that pairing at 12. Yeah. Because quarterbacks drive clicks, quarterbacks drive views, quarterbacks drive all of that. And so yep. there's a big question about who this quarterback five is and who where are they going to go. So oh, we're going to throw Bo Nix in there early because it's going to generate views. It's going to generate clicks. It's going to yep. generate money. Yeah, there. Let's move forward. There was a there was a question that I was gonna grab. I can't find it anymore. Um, I think it was Colin Wood is the one that asked it, talking about um, how stats th- that we get are different from what your eyes see. I want to get away from the quarterback conversation. Let's let's go to the other side of the football. Um, actually, you know what? We can. I got one more here, really quick. Um, because it's uh, it ties into something that uh, the Broncos obviously have another need on the offensive side of the football. The tight end position is one that they they desperately need to find an answer to. And a couple of weeks ago, I talked to I, I wrote up a, um, a, a five players at the tight end position that could help round out the room. But the Broncos, we all know that they need to find a guy that can play like attached as a line of scrimmage because it, and honestly, it, it can play as a receiver as well. With Greg Dulcich, you never know if he's going to be healthy or not. I mean, the guy's a, a one false step away from destroying another hamstring. Um, but two guys that fit that bill in terms of like athletic receivers that have really good upside there, but also are like quality blockers that I wrote about, uh, tip Ryman out of Illinois and AJ Barner from, from Michigan. So Eric, I'm going to ask you just quickly here, aside from the character concerns for Ryman, who believes that birds aren't real, like he's a conspiracy theorist, uh, which player would you rather fit into this Broncos scheme in terms of, uh, like a real natural wide tight end that you can play as a blocker that also has the receiving upside to work over the middle of the field here. There are no character concerns with tip Ryman. There <laughs> are none. He has since clarified that he was trolling. He was being a joke. Okay. I, so I missed, joke. I missed that. I missed that. He was making fun of flat earthers. Okay. Um, that is a, a popular, you know, uh, thing going around. There's obviously some questions after the combine when he made that comment. Some people thought he was serious. Some people thought he was joking. It has since been clarified. He was making a joke. He doesn't actually believe birds aren't real. Um, there, there's no character concerns. And even if he did, that's not enough to be a character concern. Right. Um, it's the same thing with the guy who doesn't believe space is real or the planets are real. Um, he was being serious, but it's yeah. not a character concern there. Right. Uh, the deep safety from wherever 
Okay. I think it was Texas Tech. I know it was a Texas school. I can't remember if it was a and or Texas Tech. One of the two. But, but um, yeah, either of those tight ends, they'd be fine. Um, I think they both don't offer a whole lot as the, you know, in the receiving game. Um, they can be a little bit more, you know, safety outlets a little bit. Um, I think you do get a little bit more with Barner as a receiver than you do Ryman, but not a whole lot. Um, okay. I'd be fine with either of those guys early day three. Okay. I, I like Barner. I think that there's some untapped potential there. And it kind of goes into the, the JJ McCarthy conversation a little bit in terms of um, just what the Michigan offense is, because they're so run heavy. Uh, they focused on, they, they also have the other kid and I can't remember his name. He's not eligible this season, but he's going to probably be tight end one next year. Um, but uh, Barner as that number two tight end really uses a blocker and they didn't really task him a lot with a bunch of receiving responsibilities. So I think there's some untapped potential there. And I think that there's a lot of untapped potential there. So I would rather go um, Barner in this particular situation. Ryman though, that dude's dominant at the point of attack, man. He's really fun. Um, Let's go to the defensive side of the football. Uh, and this is one, Eric, you and I have kind of gone back and forth on this a, a couple of different times in terms of just the versatility in, in what the players that um, Vance Joseph is looking for. He's also he's, he's always had like very versatile players that he can't figure out exactly how to deploy with them. But last season, this defense was not you know, like the, the archetype of what Vance Joseph likes to run schematically. Like they, they ran a lot of off zones. They they couldn't get after the quarterback. They had to bring extra pressure um, from the second level in terms of trying to get after the quarterback. So it, it really was different than what you're typically going to see from a Vance Joseph defense. With that being said, though, you, you need edge rush help. You need cornerback help. You need safety help. How do you go about navigating a situation like that where you don't exactly know what this scheme is going to look like? Are we looking for more scheme versatile players or are we looking for the specific traits like press man coverage from the outside, man coverage from your safeties, the ability to bend the edges as a, as a, as a pass rusher and really get home that way? What is your opinion on this, and how do the Broncos go about fixing it uh, with the with their day three picks uh, this year in the draft? They know what scheme they're running. They know okay. if they're going to stick to more zone or and blitz heavy, or if they're going to try to play more man and uh, win with less. Um, they know that. Whether it works out or not, and they end up changing in season, that remains to be seen. But they know what they're going to do. They're, you're not entering this point of your – of the off season without, Oh, what are we going to do? Right. Uh, my assumption here is that they're wanting to go to what Vance Joseph does. They want to play more man coverage. They and blitz from playing man occasionally and not blitz at quite as heavy as they did last year. Mm -hmm. um, still, will blitz, still will blitz a lot. That is why they want corner. They want a cornerback. That is why they still are looking at safety help. That is why they're still looking at edge help. That is why they are um, looking for interior defensive line help um, as in pass rushers. Like they want to be able to get after the quarterbacks with fewer, so they can drop more into coverage and play play man on the outside and zone on the inside to help with the tight issues with the, that they that they've had with tight ends. Um, they know that. Like they've known that there mm -hmm. there was a plan before the season ended of what they were wanting to do this for this next season. Sorry, I can't remember the rest of what your question was. Oh, it just players that um that I that I've been watching. I'm I'm bringing some of my analysis to the show in terms of the the scouting reports and stuff like that. There's a there's a couple of guys that really kind of piqued my interest in terms of like that scheme position versatility that they have. Um, Kyrie oh. Jackson is one that uh, the cornerback out of Oregon. Um, off off coverage is probably the best for him. Um, actually, no, excuse me. Uh, press cover is probably better for him. Off zone, he looks a little bit wonky in terms of his change of direction ability, but he has the the coverage ability you have as compared to like a guy like Jarvis Brownlee, who is definitely very much press man only. Do not ever put him in in off zone because he doesn't have the the recovery speed or the the twitch in his lower half. Um, or like going to the safety position, you have a guy like a Dejon Anthony from. Um, from Ole Miss, who's going to be a, a very good man coverage player as compared to like a Malik Mustafa, who has that do it all versatility, who can play a little bit inside a linebacker if you need him to and run support. He's also um, he's also a very good slot quarterback and he has good enough range to play as a single high post player. Like the, the, how would you go about kind of molding these molding this roster to fit what Vance Joseph wants? Are you looking for the versatile players? Or are you looking for the more specific scheme fits? I would not give Vance Joseph anybody that's deemed super like position versatile. Okay. Time and time again, he's shown he can't make them work. Right. Yeah. We've talked about that <laughs> multiple different times. So why do we, why would we keep doing that? 
That's my well, opinion. It, Whether the Broncos actually share that, I don't know. But if a guy continues to show that he cannot develop a position versatile player and ha- make them work and get them to work in his scheme, why do you keep doing it? Start giving right. him like, hey, here is an actual linebacker that isn't an edge or a linebacker. Develop him as a linebacker. Because what you also get, and this was an issue that Vic Fangio highlighted with Baron Browning coming out. He played so many different roles in the defense. He never really developed that one of them. Right. You get that issue with these versatile guys coming out of college. They don't really fully develop him one. It's one thing that people have a knock on Terry and Arnold for. Because mm-hmm. of his time at safety, he's not fully developed that you want at um, corner. So you are proje- making a big, big projection there um, for him to continue to develop. So you want these guys, and if you are you can draft one of these versatile players, but you better have a set position in mind of where you're going to start developing them from, okay. developing them from day one. Right. Um, I, so I think Kyrie, I... you mentioned Kyrie Jackson. That's one of the names that I that I can remember. If Denver drafts him, it would be with the intent, should be with the intent of keeping him at corner and developing him at corner. Right. If yeah. they go with Mustafa, it should be with developing him as a safety. I think he, right. I th- I'm with you. I think he's kind of a do-it-all safety. But you want to develop him in one spot first. Um, mm-hmm. You don't want situations with like Zayvon Collins or Drew Sanders or anything like this, where you're moving back and forth multiple times your rookie year and you're never really developing in one spot. Right. I I, I think I misworded my my question because you and I agree on that. The the position versatility here, while I value that in terms of what I do with my with my with my grades and stuff, um, what I think what I more I was trying to get was like this the schematic versatility of a player like a Kyrie Jackson who can play off the ball and he can play and press. I'm not saying like move him to safety just because he has the traits to do that. Um, th- I guess that's more of my question. Are you are you trying to find like some scheme versatility with these guys? Or are you really wanting those specific this is the scheme. This is what we're going to do with you, kind of players like like a Jarvis Brownlee as compared to um, uh, Chris Abrams Drain, for example, uh, the 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 kid out of Missouri who is very fluid, very scheme versatile. He doesn't really have like that. He's more jack of all trades than he is true, legitimate press or zone. Like he can do it all. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you don't. It's a double-edged sword here. You you want to draft for your scheme, but at the same time, you don't. Um, as Scott highlights in the back, is the scheme is always changing. Vance Joseph, they can draft for this year for the scheme and everything like that for Vance, mm-hmm. what Vance Joseph wants to do, but then they don't. They fall flat. He's fired, and right. now it's potentially a new scheme. So. You do want scheme versatile players, but the better thing is bet on athletes. Right. Okay. Bet on yeah. athletes and your coach's ability to develop them. Yeah, makes sense. Because the more the athleticism, there's a good trend, um, especially with defensive backs. There's a good correlation between athletic guys and scheme versatility. Mm-hmm. Guys who can don't have issues, you know, converting from one scheme to another. There are obviously some exceptions for it, um, but it's not. And it, it's not a it's not as tough as the worst athlete you are, the more likely you are to be pigeonholed into one scheme. Um, so you you kind of want to draft those, you know, scheme versatile guys, but you don't want to do it go overboard with it to where the point where you don't really you have a bunch of scheme versatile guys, but nobody who can really be a lockdown thing in your scheme. Right. Um, and fortunately for the Broncos this year, if they want to go more man heavy, like I think, they have that guy in yeah. the defensive backfield. Patrick Sertan, he is mm-hmm. an elite man corner who has some issues in zone, still a good corner in zone, just not as good as he is in man. So you, they can sit there and do those versatile guys to go next to it. I think last year they went, the com- I'm still boggled by last year when they decided to trade up for Riley Moss um, because it was, they were preparing for man and they got a zone exclusive corner. Um, and then we never saw the field. Now we still have questions about who's the corner going to be. Um, so, so you got to watch with the scheme versatility. General rule is is you draft versatility, you draft athletic versatile guys, you sign scheme fits. As Scott kind of right. highlights in the, in the private, right? Chat. And and that makes sense. And Scott come in here before I grab Michael really fast. He says uh, coordinators change every two years at least. I mean, if he's if he's bad, he gets fired. If he's good, he gets hired as a head coach. So, and you're absolutely correct. I mean, every single NFL team in the last two years has changed their offensive coordinator. Literally every single one. That includes the Chiefs. Obviously, they just moved on from Eric Bieniemy. The 
the 49ers have had guys poached. The Packers, every good team has their um, has their position coaches change hands at least once every two years. Uh, Michael Ronquillo jumping in here to close out the show saying, good, uh, great show tonight, Lance and Eric on the Dub Valley Deep Divers podcast. Go Broncos. And again, go Michael. We definitely appreciate your support and everybody else's support. I mean, we got a lot of a lot of good comments in here tonight. A lot of good conversation. Michael, a couple of different times. David Cromelo throwing down work with $30 on Super Chat. Phil McLaughlin a couple of times in there. Mike Edel, again, with a new name, a $10 Super Chat. We appreciate that and everybody else's love and support. Thank you all for joining us here on a great Friday evening for Dove Valley Deep Divers. Um, Eric, is there anything else you really want to kind of land on before we get out of here? Or uh, any last words before I close the show? When it's all said and done, when the Broncos make the draft picks, we're all, even though we may disagree on prospects, may disagree on who the best quarterback is, we all want the Broncos to be successful. We all have different opinions on how that gets there, but we still want to see wins because I don't know. I'm I'm pretty sure I'm with you all right this, but I don't can't say for sure. I am so sick and tired of watching them lose. I yeah. am sick and tired of watching them lose games that they should come out winning. Like, just tired of it. Uh, I'm, I'm have a great night. Have a great weekend. We'll see you all next week. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that just quickly here. Um, I started with Mile High Huddle in May of 2018. I have not seen a winning season from the Stanford Broncos team in terms of me covering the team. I'm tired of the losing. I think that this year the Broncos are going to be awful, quite honestly. It doesn't matter what the quarterback situation looks like. They are going to be a bad football team. They'll be lucky to win five games, in my opinion, at least as it stands right now. And I'm here for that. Because that means the official start of this rebuild is is on, and they're going to then have good draft capital to rebuild this roster. And they have a coach that I believe in. I do believe in Sean Payton's vision. I think that he is. This is a deliberate tear it down and start it over. And when he gets the opportunity to get his hands on the quarterback that he wants to have in this in this organization, it's going to take off. And I'm I'm here for this. It may not be just this year. It might be next year as well. But give it some time here and trust in this process that I think is, is going to take us in the right direction. And Eric, you're going to get back to like it was when like, I know that you covered the the Super Bowl, uh, that, that Super Bowl team. So you got to actually witness good Denver Broncos football in terms of being an, an, uh, an analyst. I wanted to say analysis, but uh, that's not the right word. Regardless case in point here, it's going to be rough again, guys, but don't ever gatekeep on people and their opinions. Don't do the whole you don't know ball thing. Let it, let people have their opinions and let's just have a good time talking football because it's it's what we all love and appreciate doing, especially here on the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. You guys can continue to follow us on uh, in the conversation by following us on Twitter, by finding me at Lance S underscore MHH for Eric at Eric Trickle. Scott uh, Kennedy behind the scenes running the ones and twos. Thank you for your help tonight. We appreciate you, man. Uh, at Scout Kennedy. Also, guys, while you're at it, make sure you guys are following at Mile High Huddle. That is the mother account where you guys get breaking news and analysis regarding your Denver Broncos, uh, film breakdowns, opinion articles, all of our draft content that we have coming to you on a daily basis. Anything that suits your Broncos fancy, you're going to find it at Mile High Huddle and on milehighhuddle.com. <coughs> Excuse me, Facebook supporters, <coughs> go to uh, facebook.com forward slash mile high huddle pod. Uh, keep the conversation going on over there. And uh, guys, if you're not financially able to support the show in terms of super chats, go into uh, uh, mhhmerch.com and get yourself a hat or a t shirt, anything like that. The three things everybody should be doing right now subscribe. Subscribe to Mile High Huddle across all social media platforms. Um, like every video you guys see. And if you love it, share it, guys. Please get it out into in front of as many Broncos fans as possible, all your friends and family. It helps us out so much because without your guys' love and support, we couldn't do what we do best, which is cover your Denver Broncos. Now, with all of that said, guys, we're going to close out the show and let you guys get back to your, to your families on a wonderful Friday evening. For Eric Trickle, I am Lance Sanderson. You all stay safe and take care. Have a great rest of your weekend. And as always, go Broncos. We'll see you guys same time, same place next week.